Well, and, and there's always partnerships, right? I think that's one thing that we've become very strong at is developing partnerships with different organizations that have the same sort of interests or um, missions. And, you know, one of the things is it's not just kids in schools. We've, we've seen over the last two years, kids at home virtually stuck at home, books were trapped in the schools. Um, I think that this is an industry that has so much amazing stuff to offer the world obviously culture arts literary arts everything is you know the world that we live in at uh in my job but we want to make sure that we are evolving and changing and growing and learning like these are all the things that we need to be doing because it, if this past two years didn't teach us that um i think it's there's many ways to get something done and i think historically it was one way and it was oh well, we can't do it because we don't do that well i think we've all proven that that's not the case we can there's lots of things that can be done with just a little extra work Living in the next chapter, I have a guest with me, and I'm so happy to have Meredith touching with me today. Meredith is part of the group that puts on great reading events to encourage students that reading should be fun, and we get to talk together today. And I got to be part of a, an event in Niagara Falls called the Forest of Reading, and I got to see firsthand students who love reading and got together in one place to celebrate all things reading and authors and everything great about that. Meredith on the podcast today. Here we go. You ready? Welcome to the podcast, everyone. I am happy to have someone. I was given a challenge. Let's see if you can get this guest on your podcast. And I'm like, well, I don't know if this is possible, but I sent off an email, crossed my fingers and my toes, and the answer came back. Yes, Meredith is here with me today. And uh, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. We were at an event in Niagara Falls called the Forest of Reading. And we met with great students and teachers all about the, the love of reading. And Meredith, you and your organization are part of the process of getting this created and out to our students. So happy to have you on the podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you. So, yeah, like I said, when the email came back and said, yes, <laughs> I did a little happy dance because um, when my wife, Jen, and I were at this event in Niagara Falls, we saw students that were passionate about reading. We saw authors in the hallways, great speakers, a really well done event. Mm -hmm. The author tables were all set up with all the books. I even saw a book by my one of my favorite authors when I was a student back in the day. Gordon Corman's books were all set out. And I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. he, he came to my school when I was like in grade seven or eight. He must have been 10 when he came. I don't know how old he was, but he came and read to our class. And I have been a fan of his forever. And then to see his book sitting there, and I'm like, what? So I was so cool. It's it's amazing. Um, thank you so much for helping to put on events like this. Tell us a little bit about why maybe the Forest of Reading, for example, and some of the other events are so important for students today in getting in love with reading? Well, before I start with that, I should uh, commend the Niagara School Boards for putting on these events. So they um, take our program, run them throughout the year, and then for several years, they put on a uh, festival of a festival of type for, for their kids and working with their public library um, staff and, and the whole community. And so it is amazing. And um, they're such wonderful people to work with. Um, and it is, as you said, one event. Um, they also should be um, congratulated for putting it on during um, the end of a pandemic yeah. because it was very hard to do in-person events. We were unable to do our big 12,000 person one at Harborfront Center um, last year. So we, for three years, we've done the virtual festival. Uh, but the Forest of Reading started 25 years ago or more than that now uh, as a, it was inspired from a reading program in Texas. And our executive director at OLA and the deputy director came back from Texas and started the program uh, with the Silver Birch Award. And it just accumulated every couple of years, we'd add a new program. I have been at the OLA for 20 year, 21 years almost and did not 
expect to be there this long. Um, but I really have the best job, so it's hard to leave. And I think the the thing that makes it exciting is that we've picked up so many different programs. So we now cover from kindergarten all the way up to adult. Our focus is really on the school age programs. And then in 2007, the festival started where we started celebrating the uh, winners in person all together. We used to have small events for each program, but we decided to bring it all together. And it started with just 3000 kids that came in and they come in from all over. They come from Barrie and, um, you know, Niagara, they go train in. And it really is the only way you can describe it is it's a rock concert for reading. And it's where kids have like fall in love with their authors. Like you say, Gordon Corman. I mean, it's pretty hard not to be starstruck by um, such a, such a guy. When I first met him, I expected him to be about 30 years older because he has been writing since he was 13 uh, and published since he was 13. So it's, it's pretty amazing um, to watch the growth. And I think every year we keep trying to push the, Uh, limits a little bit in terms of everything from our selecting to how we're implementing the program and being very mindful of how we are moving this program forward because of the impact that it has not only on kids, but it has on the Canadian publishing industry, as well as the authors. Um, The Forest of Reading is the largest driver of kids' book sales in the country. So when publishers get a call to say that their book has, one of their books has been selected, they have a number of stipulations that they have to agree to. Um, but one of the big ones is they have to be able to provide um, thousands of copies to our official wholesaler, as well as to retailers and to um, independent book st- stores. So it is, it's a big, big difference. And it's um, in some instances, if you have multiple nominees, it can be a six figure difference to a publishing house. Wow. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the the beginning stages because I have had Canadian authors mm-hmm. come on the podcast and they are curious about programs like this to get their books in front of a reading audience. So that's kind of is that how this is done? Is it curated a certain way where you're looking for certain types of authors? Uh, so our program is Canadian. Uh, we do have a permanent resident or Canadian. Um, the, uh, the book needs to be authored. Uh, illustrators can be, most of them are usually Canadian since we do have, in my opinion, the best talent of illustrators in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the books do need to be published um, because we do support the Canadian book um, book sector, which is a big thing. And I know it does ruffle some feathers because um, self-published authors do often want to have their um, books considered. In this job, I've always learned to say there's not a hard no to anything because maybe along the, the, you know, as we go forward in the years, possibly we could have, you know, more trees in our forest and more, um, you know, different kinds of authors, but at this point it's published authors. So the publishers generally submit the book in almost all cases, they submit the books for consideration. So in 2022, we had almost a thousand books sent in from Canadian publishers, um, to be considered for our 10 programs. So that's a hundred books for the, um, you know, a hundred books for the school age programs out of a thousand. So there's 900 no's. And I know it makes uh, authors really sad when there's, when they don't get on the list, but on the flip side, um, my committee members, I have a number of um, members that get to call the authors and that's their role as they liaise with the author and they create activities. They, they're doing the programming. Uh, so that's one set of committee members and their best job is when they get to call an author and say they've been nominated Yes, yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, and then we have a group of selection committee members that come from the education sector and the library sector. So our selection committee members are working with the kids of that age group that they're selecting. So if you're a high school teacher or a newly retired high school teacher or um, teacher librarian or library tech, or maybe you're a public librarian in teen services, they apply to be on our committees. And it's a big job. Like they read uh, the grade seven, eight uh, age group, Red Maple. They read almost 170 novels this year. And then to get it down to 10 is pretty hard. So That is how it is curated. There is a a list of criteria. So it's everything from literary, um, uh, literary merit down to uh, 
um, I'm playing it there. We have a number of criteria, but I say this and I've said it, I think 10 times this week is we are not a literary award. We are a engagement and reading for fun. And so sometimes people get that confused. And when I was talking to, I think it was Stacy at, uh, for the Niagara Forest of Reading, she was saying and kind of explaining as we saw the kids file in for their first uh, meeting of the day, that these kids are winning their way into this by reading and doing all the work of their schools and then representing their schools as they come to this event. So there's a, a component for the students to, to actively be a part of the reading process to even come to an event like Forest of Reading. That's, is, that's kind of how that works, right? Well, it depends. It totally depends on the school board, okay. uh, the community. So we encourage the kids. It, so if you're in grade four and you decide you're going to grade five and you're going to read the Silver Birch fiction books, we have 10 books that come from, it's a balanced list. So it's not all books about, you know, fantasy. It, it's a, you know, there's a mix of, of books, which is great, which gets kids reading different genres. But the idea is, is that, um, we suggest that they read five of 10 minimum to be able to vote. However, we leave it up to the, uh, we leave it up to whoever's running the program to decide how they want to do voting okay. and how um, we have to say five of 10, because we want to make sure that we're being fair to everyone. But I've been doing this job a long time. And, and one of the things is if a kid has never read a book and they read a, one book, let them vote because it's the whole yeah. thing is about getting them uh, interested in, in reading and, get, and getting them, you know, when I hear people make them do book reports on the forest, I kind of cringe because, mm. you know, you want to make sure the kids read the book, but it's also, if you tie work always with reading, it creates a negative feel for the, for the young person. So we're developing the passion for reading. That's the mm -hmm. ultimate goal for this, right? Totally. Into the excitement for reading. Um, and, and I and I will say that, like with the festival, for a lot of um, communities, having an event or something tied with this is an incentive. So it really is okay if you read five books or you read ten books. And there's some kids that read like thirty or forty; they're amazing. You get to go; you automatically get to go on this field trip to the festival. So every event, you know, some school boards celebrate just in their libraries, some celebrate just in their classes, some just celebrate as book clubs, some, some do. We've done festivals all over. We've gone to Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Perry Sound, North Bay, Ottawa. So we've done all sorts of events in different shapes and sizes, uh, venues. So it's really about what works for that community. How would you like to see this grow over the years? Do you see, do you have like a long-term vision for this? Well, I always have a long-term vision. <laughs> um, I, you know, I want to, we're the only program in all seriousness. We're the only program that goes from kindergarten all the way to adults. So we are one of the only programs in Canada or, uh, that has a picture book program and a, a program for teens. There's lots of middle um, grade stuff around amazing programs across the country. But what I would like to see is where we fill the gaps. Uh, we also have three French programs, French language programs yeah. that, um, you know, are great for French immersion or French language schools outside of Quebec and inside Quebec. But I think um, our goal is to continue to grow across the whole country. Last year, we had 45 schools from outside of Ontario. The misconception is that this is an Ontario-based program. It is a project of the OLA, the Ontario Library Association, but it is a nationwide program. Our, the authors come from all coast to coast to coast, so it's not um, just Ontario authors, nor is it schools or libraries just from Ontario. And I'm hoping this year we see upwards of 200 plus uh, schools from outside so we can continue to grow. So with the beginning stages of this early on in the days of, of having this for students, have you seen growth as far as the buy-in from students, buy-in from teachers and school boards? Are they embracing this? Have you seen that kind of grow over the years? Absolutely. We had a previously to the pandemic, 83% of who registered for the forest were from schools uh, throughout the pandemic and with public libraries closing uh, and being closed to the public and to in-person programming, we saw a big increase uh, in public libraries um, registering all their, of their branches. So for us, it's about registering for the forest. So when you register your school, 
um, or your public library branch, or maybe you're a parent and just want to register your child and a couple of their friends, there's a fee, a small fee, uh, like $25 to $55, depending on which. That gives you all the access to all of the resources, all of the nominee information, virtual author visits, all of that stuff. The books are separate. So we have an official wholesaler every three years, um, depending on the contract. Um, it goes to an RFP. Our current uh, wholesaler is Tin Lens, but we encourage people to buy from independent bookstores as well as from our wholesalers. Um, and the idea is, is that um, the books is the separate. So you can belong to the program and maybe only have a couple of books, but if you want to run the whole um, program, some libraries already have a couple of the books in their libraries. So the idea is we're trying to get as many registrants as possible. Last year, we had um, almost 2000 individual uh, schools and libraries registered, and we're hoping to see that number continue to grow. In terms of readers, we're about, um, this number stayed pretty, that was our highest numbers in registrants last year, but the numbers are around 270,000 kids. Yeah. Uh, we're starting to collect more data. It's just very hard to quantify. Um, we have been told anecdotally and by people that fill out the evaluation at the end of the year, that reading engagement does go up as a result of reading for fun and not because they're being told to. But out of 2,000 people that run this program, only 75 people fill out the evaluation. So I do believe strongly that the evaluations only ever get filled out if, um, you know, people have something constructive to say. So yeah. often when you have a low, uh, low evaluation rate, I feel like that means everybody's happy. So what about, what about students that are, that have struggle reading or they can't read. Um, I'm thinking visually impaired, possibly people mm -hmm. challenged. Is there a part of the program that addresses students that want to be a part of this reading program, but mm -hmm. physically can't pick okay. up a book and read it? How, how do we address but they that? They can be part of the forest of reading. So one of the things that we're incredibly proud of is about six year, six or seven years ago, one of the stipulations in the contract for publishers is they have to if they are nominated and accept that they will be as part of our list, which is all confidential until October 15th, they have to provide an unlocked PDF or EPUB file. Um, so it is provided to OLA and we work with Arrow in Ontario, as well as SELA. So um, who is out, who's uh, the center for equity library services and um, Arrow is alternate, Alternative Education Resources of Ontario. So by mandate, if a child has a print disability or needs a different version of a book, their educator or their parent or their library person can reach out to Arrow in Ontario or CELA um, anywhere across Canada, and they have to make that book available in an alternative alternative format. So whether it be Daisy or Braille or audio book, um, it has to be done. Many books are now available commercially by eBooks, but mm -hmm. if it is a print disability, then uh, in our province of Ontario, it is something that has to be made available to the kids. So I was told seven years ago that I would never be able to do this and publishers would never agree to it. But wow. they do because they trust us, and we know that they're they know that we're not sending their EPUB files out to the world. They are going to the um, repository at Arrow, and and know that it is for um, young readers to have access. And access is a huge part of our mandate. And last year, I think we had about two thousand uh, checkouts from Arrow alone. See, so you know that. <laughs> that makes my heart happy to hear that you've thought about that and you have that in place because you don't want anyone to miss out on the joy of being part of this program and and reading and and the community right mm -hmm. they don't want anyone to be excluded so that is that's spectacular and i i anticipated that was the answer coming so <laughs> it's great to hear that well and and there's always partnerships right i think that's one thing that we've become very strong at is developing partnerships with different organizations that have the same sort of interests or um, missions. And, you know, one of the things is it's not just kids in schools. We've, we've seen over the last two years, kids at home, virtually stuck at home, books were trapped in the schools. Yeah. Um, I think that this is an industry that has so much 
amazing stuff to offer the world. Obviously, culture, arts, literary arts, everything is, you know, the world that we live in at, uh, in my job. But we want to make sure that we are evolving and changing and growing and learning. Like these are all the things that we need to be doing because if this past two years didn't teach us that, um, I think it's, there's many ways to get something done. And I think historically it was one way and it was, oh, well, we can't do it because we don't do that. Well, I think we've all proven that that's not the case. We can, there's lots of things that can be done with just a little extra work. How else have you had to pivot as a, as an organization through the pandemic in staying, continuing to grow and continuing to grow your community and work with your authors? What has the pandemic taught you and your organization about how how we can survive in an online world to some extent? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the OLA is the largest and oldest library association in the country. So obviously the Forest of Reading is a project of that. We sit independently outside uh, in terms of website and you know all of my committee members and things, but we still ultimately report into the board. Uh, 60% of our budget came from events. And so when we moved, when we, when the pandemic went, I, we are also incredibly proud to say we were able to keep all 15 staff members uh, employed. However, we did go to a three day work week and then a four day work week and then back to five days, which is a commitment to our staff that they really felt strongly. I am the only full-time person that works on the forest of reading. And I have uh, two um, people in marketing communications that work uh, with me as well. So it is, Often people think we are a team of 50 that run the largest library super conference and uh, 12 signature events, but we're just a really tiny team. Um, And we had to learn very quickly how to adapt virtually and make it engaging. And so we, our conference was held in January, 2020. That was the last in-person conference. And then we went to a uh, virtual format and it was, good timing for us in terms of the fact that we were able to see how other people had done it, seeing what get feedback from people Uh, so much so that this year we are going back to an in-person conference in Toronto in February, but we will have a digital experience as well because we were able to reach so many people in different parts Mm. of the country and abroad. So we have people from the Netherlands and the U S coming to our conference. So in person, we usually have 5,000, uh, virtually last year we had 8,000. So it's been a little bit of trial and error, uh, in order to, to keep, be able to at least break even on these events. And so we've done that. I think with the forest specifically, we were able to partner with CBC books, which was really exciting for us. Um, Ali Hassan, who's amazing. He hosted our awards. So the first year, we just did awards. Then the next year we did awards with interviews. And then last year we did awards with interviews as part of it all together as one. And plus we did some signature events with, um, you know, 25 years ago, Hannah suitcase won the silver birch. It's the number one selling kids book, um, in many respects. So we were able to interview Karen Levine, the author who's fabulous. We had Andre DeGrasse who was nominated last year. So he, we had, he and Lucky, Lucky Bud from, uh, who's the illustrator. Andre was, uh, in Qatar when he called in. So we had this amazing kid, Ayanara, who we've partnered with. She's this fabulous kid from Hamilton and she interviewed him. So there were like other events. So it's just, it's more about, making sure that you just try stuff and see what sticks. Uh, Everybody in my world knows that uh, I just love a good pilot. Cause if you say you're going to pilot something, you don't Mm -hmm. really have to make sure you don't have to write up a whole lot of stuff. I like to just try things and see what works. So you mentioned earlier that you didn't think you'd be here this long in this role with that in mind, what keeps you here? Why, why are you still here? So I think, for me personally, this job allows me to have some creativity, but also to have some stuff that um, stays the same. So, you know, there's a lot of redundancy every year, the same things over and over that, you know, it's, oh, great. I've got 157 nominees this year. Okay. Let's gather all their information and let's figure out all their books. So there's, especially right now for the next, you know, month, it's a lot of that, but there's almost something soothing about 
knowing, okay, I know how to do this. I, this is, I've been doing this. So this has been my full-time job since uh, 2009. And so it used to only be 30% of my job and uh, it's been like 30% of my job. And then when I came back after maternity leave, I said to um, our executive director that I really think the forest can be bigger. Um, I just need more time to be able to to do it. And she was really great and agreed. And so we've been able to sort of, there's, so it's kind of, everyone's heard me say this, but it's 50% of my job is the same every year. And 50, 50% is, is new and trying, um, you know, fun things like the festival, like we started as one day. And I mean, the next day, a couple of years later, we're like, okay, let's do this on two days. And then let's do a all French festival. I don't speak a word of French, but it was sort of like, okay, let's try this and see um, what, and again, it goes back to the partnerships with people. And we have a really fabulous community of um, committee members, but we also have an advisory committee that we started a couple of years ago. I want to preface it is not a board because I don't want to have a board Mm -hmm. that I have to answer to, but it's, it's a group of amazing individuals from uh, the publishing community and the writing community that I've known over the years that I sort of, okay, they're going to tell me what I'm missing, or they're going to tell us what's out there. Like the group of authors that are on our advisory, they're out in classrooms, pre-pandemic, they were out in classrooms. During the pandemic, they're hustling, doing school visits online, but they're seeing the kids. So the idea is, is that, okay, what, what's missing in the schools? What could we be doing to help educators? Um, with the publishers, you know, what are we missing? Is there something we're not doing? And I think the big thing that we've learned since 2009 is just making sure that we are transparent. There's no secrets. There's nothing we're hiding. And I also said recently, you just have to, this is about reading for fun. Like it's not, it's simple. It's a simple, simple concept that there's lots of good. So we are living in a world that is extremely polarizing and controversial and angry right now. And so we saw a little bit of that last year where books were being pulled from shelves and uh, the whole banned book movement has reared its head again. And, you know, we don't agree with censorship. We don't agree with banning books or, you know, at one point there was somebody was burning books, which that's never going to end up well um, if that ends up on the news, but it's just more about, you know, let's let these kids, our lists are curated. They're curated for a reason. Uh, They are with the kid in mind thinking, okay, there are kids that want to learn and and know again, it's, I shouldn't even say learn. I should say enjoy. And so I think that for the last couple of years where we have stretched and grown is in our selection policies and in our transparency to content and books and our stance on protecting kids getting books in their hands and not being limited access to that. So Meredith, to date, what has been one of your most proudest moments as you look back and you, you're you either in the room or you're watching something happen, you have your arms crossed, you're, you're like, yeah, this this feels good. This is, this is why we're here. Anything stand out? Oh, 100% the festival in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, when I stand and in the operations tent. So we have a tent that's strategically placed that sort of looks over the whole venue. And when I see, you know, it's over three days when I see 5,000 kids screaming for an author, uh, it's pretty amazing. And I would say that to your point, which I thought was funny at the beginning saying, you know, you were asked, you were asked to have me come and, you know, good luck getting me. I'm very accessible, (laughs) uh, but I also don't like to be seen a lot. And so at the festival, we have a hundred authors, almost a hundred authors that come to the festival and most of them don't see me because I'm, you know, running the logistics. I often pop in just to say hi Or if there's somebody, I remember when my girls were, I have a 14 year old and 12 year old. And when they were little, they read all the Stella books. And um, uh, I just remember Marie Louise Gay had written a a new book and it was on the Blue Spruce list. And I thought I have to go and meet her because I just, and I was like starstruck when I met her because she was like, oh my God, you're Meredith. And I was like, oh my God, you're (laughs) Marie Louise because she looks like Stella in real life. Mm. And so it was really fun. And same with Gordon Corman. I just have such admiration for him. We've had a great relationship over the years. So I, um, I, the truth be told is I'm not a big reader, which is why I'm so passionate about this and why I think I grew up really struggling with reading. And so I think for me to do my job 
you have to be more of a logistics person. If you are really into meeting all of the authors and reading every single book, you'd never be able to do your job. (laughs) No, no. Um, Any advice, Meredith, for a new Canadian author that's getting into writing on, you know, how, how to shape their message for an audience of readers and making their books fun? Any thoughts on that? I would say get involved in the Canadian writing community. Uh, children's author, children's authors and young adult authors in this country are the biggest supporters of each other. I hear time and time again that they are in writing groups with each other. They have each other critique their work. And I think that's really important. Um, I actually don't think there is a group of authors that doesn't do that. Uh, they you know, your publisher and your editor is one thing, but having in the early stages, and I think it's a really great way to bounce ideas. It's such a isolating job for many, but it doesn't have to be if you, if you have these um, writing groups. So that's, I would say that would probably be what I've observed, observed over the years for sure. So Meredith, how do people find more information about all the great stuff happening and get more joy in their reading? Where do we send everybody? Uh, so we have a number of spots. You can go find us on Twitter. Uh, it's backslash forest of reading. Uh, we're also on Facebook. We don't have an Instagram account yet. Cause it's more we find in the, uh, teacher educator, public libraries is Twitter and uh, the author community is Facebook as well as uh, forestofreading.com. And we will have our registration opens October 1st. Uh, nominees are announced the 15th and May, 2023, we are getting for an in-person festival, but we will have, as I mentioned, a digital experience where everybody from around the world or Canada can uh, tune in for some aspect of it. Meredith, like I said, when I sent off the email, <laughs> the, the teachers that I was talking to, they're like, if you can get Meredith, again, it's a home run. And I and I do appreciate the fact that you've taken time today to to chat about this. I, I love the idea of inspiring young readers to to get in and find the joy of reading, get past it being a, a task and becoming a love. That and is every huge. kid, every kid is, I say it to my own children. It's sometimes if you hear kids say, I don't like reading, it's you just keep saying you haven't found the right book. You need to find the book that hooks you. And you we hear it all the time with authors, you know, Back, uh, you know, many, many, many decades ago, Charlotte's Web captured so many of them. I hear um, that as one, but I think it's, it is about reading for fun. And I just want to give a shout out to all the educators and library staff, but particularly those in your region in Niagara, because they're pretty awesome. Oh, they're going to like flip out when they hear this. This and our cha- our fo- our forest co-chair is Ruth Gretzinger, who's from the District School Board of Niagara, and she's amazing. There you go, Niagara. You got some love from Meredith. So <laughs> we're going to revel in that for a little while. That's really great. Thank you so much for taking time to, to talk today, share more about this, and uh, looking forward to many, many great things. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to, you know, focus on the forest of reading. That's super exciting. Awesome. Hey, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Jump over to livingthenextchapter.com our website, and you will see a spot where you can leave a voice message. We'd love to hear your feedback. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to hear from you. So if you want your voice on this podcast, yes, that's possible. Go to livingthenextchapter.com. Click the little icon, little microphone icon. Leave a voice message. We'll insert your message into the podcast. Tell us where you're listening from. Uh, Tell us your favorite guest. Maybe there's a guest we should have on the podcast. Maybe you should be our next guest. Leave us a message, livingthenextchapter.com. Again, thank you so much for listening. Please share this podcast episode with one person. That's all we're asking. Meet you over there at livingthenextchapter.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Love to hear from you. Till the next episode. It's coming up right away. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Thank you for supporting our guests. Have a great day. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. 
I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener. <laughs>